Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this uh, Socialist Tally and Labour Left uh, special, looking at some of the events from the day uh, in terms of employment practices, uh, corporate employment practices, uh, which have been appalling and shown in the um, firing of a large number of British gas engineers for refusing to get a contract with worse terms and conditions. And uh, sadly, uh, employment practices and disrespect for working people by the Labour Party as well. So we're going to that. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome onto the programme uh, our guest, Phil Bevin, and we've also got uh, my colleague, Bonnie, from Socialist Telly, uh, and we'll be chatting with that. We may be joined by uh, Demo when he gets uh, gets back from uh, from giving his son a lift, I gather, and uh, possibly by some of the British Gas workforce or former workforce, uh, if they manage to uh, join us after their uh, various meetings and uh, you know union discussions and stuff today. Uh, so, Phil, Bonnie, thank you for uh, joining us. Um, yeah, so let's let's just go. We'll start off on the on the British Gas stuff because that's that's huge and, and horrific. Um, British Gas, and, and we featured one of the British Gas workers here back in January uh, on Socialist Telly. Uh, they were told by their management that uh, they were all going to be fired and rehired on another contract with much worse terms and conditions. Uh, amounted, if I get the, if I remember the details correctly, to about six extra weeks of unpaid work in a year um, that was going to be required from them, and much more adverse shift patterns and so on. And they began uh, an industrial action over that series of strikes, uh, and sadly they haven't been successful in that through the GMB union. Uh, but um, yeah, some of the workers who, who felt that they couldn't do otherwise have been forced to sign. Uh, these new and, and poorer contracts and around between a thousand and fifteen hundred British gas engineers uh, refused to sign and uh, are, are out of their British gas jobs at least if not uh, out of work altogether and hopefully those guys have, have got themselves into new work um, so let's let's have a chat Bonnie you've worked a lot on employment practices give us your take on what's going on with the British gas people well, it's the same story every time, isn't it? You get a, a service industry that's vital to the running of the country um, and it gets privatised. The quality of the of the output gets reduced and the terms and conditions for the workforce get taken down with them. Um, it's, it's as good an example as any to say, for goodness sake, if you're not already in one, please join a trade union because they can sack these members of staff for refusing to sign inferior contracts. But um, if the if the workers are organised and unionised, then you can fight against it. And uh, Phil, you Phil is uh, from a former Loto worker, so he'll be talking in, in particular about what the... Uh, Labour Party has been getting up to in the last few days uh, and few months indeed. But um, Phil, you, have you been keeping up with the British Gas story? Yeah, I have. Um, and obviously, Bonnie's completely right. that um, it, it does illustrate um, what happens when you privatise something, um, because what happens is the it stops being run for a public service primarily and it becomes being run for profit. So um, um, you, you're inevitably going to get a, a downward pressure on workers' wages. And um, also, you know, you, you get services cut to the kind of the lowest they can be so that um, profit can be creamed off the top um, to pay out bosses and shareholders. Um, and I also think, you know, it's, it's, it's actually, when, when, you, when you think of it that way, I think privatisation is kind of, it's just, it, it's really bad management in one respect um, because, it encourages worker disputes and um, and all sorts like that. So it's kind of, it's actually, the, the pressures that it creates result in a worse service on a range of levels. Um, so it's just, it just it, privatisation in that respect just doesn't make any sense. Um, and we keep seeing these things again and again and again. Um, so yeah, join the union and fight it because we're not getting a lot of political opposition at the moment. Uh, indeed. And, you know, anecdotally, from what I'm able to uh, to pick up from social media, for example, there have been, you know, a lot of people complaining about not being able to get their uh, appointments when they need them for people to come out and fix uh, fix their boilers, particularly, and, you know, in some cases, vulnerable people. Um, and, you know, in the beginning of this uh, dispute, it seemed that, or, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, it seemed that the pandemic was being blamed for the uh, lack of appointments for people. And also, you know, the, used by the company as uh, justification for its its action against the workforce. 
Um, but then recently they've been blaming, and, and I've had a few tweets sent to me, uh, of, uh, you know, blaming the industrial action for lack of appointments when the industrial action had in fact been suspended for two weeks. And, uh, you know, so whatever's going on there, it, it seems that, you know, there, there hasn't been any lack of demand for British Gas's um, services during the pandemic, if anything more, uh, while people have been, um, you know, stuck at home. And if your home heating breaks down or whatever, or you, you're poorly and uh, isolating or, or uh, shielding to try to not catch the virus, um, you know, and, and, and this has been, again, as you, as you rightly said, Phil, landed on the workforce uh, with them expected to pay. And, you know, one of the uh, union contacts who's been involved in that dispute and works for British Gas, uh, worked for British Gas, has you know, he said to me earlier on today that, you know, they're the engineer workforce he thinks was targeted by the company um and this was his take on it at least that uh you know they've been targeted as being relatively reasonably paid relatively good contracts and you know that the company thought well if we can defeat them then you know the rest of the workforce is likely to be uh, susceptible to similar uh similar tactics now we don't know that we don't know what british gas's plans are now um but it's not it's not good um, and it's, you know, it's a particular blow to the labor movement because we've seen in recent weeks the, um, you know, British Airways workers and other people managed to defeat these attempts, um, largely thanks to the assistance of their unions. And, uh, you know, in particular, Howard Beckett from Unite has been, uh, you know, right at the heart of a lot of that uh, industrial action and, and successful industrial action. So, uh, you know, we're showing solidarity with the, uh, with the guys from British Gas and uh you know my personally i've cancelled all my british gas contracts today out of uh in protest at the way that they behaved um and you know that is an option for anybody who who has whether it's a service contract or, or the actual gas and electric supply etc uh to you know make sure that the company gets the message that people aren't happy with the way that they're they're conducting themselves um go on buddy yeah yeah, no, I was just going to say, you know, it's got to be remembered that any private company's first legal responsibility is to their shareholders and their owners. Mm. So they are driven by a motive to remove any uh, excess money or reduce their costs as much as possible to keep their shareholders happy. And when you're talking about a private necessary utility such as gas, electricity, uh, telephone, broadband, the NHS, the railways, all of these things absolutely need to be brought back into international ownership so that we ensure that the quality of work done is at its best, so that we can ensure people have safe and secure workplaces and so that we can assure that the priority is on delivering an essential service. Um, just can just see an interesting um, point appearing on the screen from uh, Truvos there. Um, and he's, he's um, and they're, they're referring to um, a, a Labour council in, in Tower Hamlets, Hamlets, which is also um, using fire and rehire uh, with new terms and conditions. And I think, I mean, I think that kind of, that shows just how far Thatcherism and privatisation has gone. Because, um, I mean, in my experience of volunteering, I've done a bit of stuff um fighting councils on, on estate regeneration and that kind of thing. Um, but it's also the same with council estate repairs. So you have this whole logic of, um, it's almost like councils and are becoming um, a funding stream for private cor corporations. So this this kind of logic of um, of taking money away from the service and from away from the people uh, that need it. Um, <laughs> is it's, it's kind of, it's expanding and it's kind of, it's going into all levels of society um so yeah i was just um just just a question really just um because you guys have you're obviously uh you've been working with unions for a long time and uh um you, you've been you've been doing this kind of this kind of work for a long time so how do we how can we fight that <coughs> excuse me um, I think part of the first problem with councils employing these absolutely diabolical um, techniques and ways of treating their staff, we've got to look at the central grants that's coming to them from the government and from the policy that's driven from Westminster. And we've also got to look at the fact that for 40 years, 
the trend has been to outsource everything. So obviously any budget that any local authority has got to spend on services ends up initially they make a short a small saving when they are outsourcing bin collection for argument's sake. But very soon the quality of that service slips down and the price gets racked up. So very, very quickly indeed, you can see that the council's um, available budget is going to get ever smaller and the biggest single cost to any local authority along with many businesses is what they spend on their staff so it's pretty mm. obvious when the pips start squeaking who's going to pay the price it's going to be the workers yes and i mean the big you know the the it's a, the whole fallacy about saving money through privatization is, is just you know it's not even hard to debunk um the idea you know that it, it's somehow more efficient to you know, have to take out, I don't know, 25 to 40, maybe more percent of, of the money you put into something uh, yeah. to take out on profits um, is a non-starter to begin with. But, you know, the, if you're going to save money or cut cost to the, you know, between the provider and whoever's, you know, awarding the contract on that service, then, you know, the only place really that that's going to happen is in driving down, as we see in, you know, with British Gas and, and elsewhere, driving down the workers' terms and conditions, driving down wages. Um, and if you do that, then you, you, you know, automatically without even having to think too hard about it, you can see the impact that that's going to have on the, you know, the national economy and the local economy. So, you know, a hospital, for example, if the, you know, if a, a hospital service cleaning, for example, is, is driven down, you know, is privatized and the workers end up on lower wages uh, and with fewer people working as well, you know, they're not spending as much money in the local shops. They're not spending, you know, they're not buying furniture they're not uh getting their house uh extended or whatever else they might be doing or buying a house if they're you know not in a position to get one yet um you know those things are, are costs that never get factored into what's the best value you know it always turns mm -hmm. out the whatever's the lowest kind of bottom line cost on paper is the is the one that's going to win the contract and if they do that by you know driving money out of the local communities and the national economy that's largely hidden so the tories get away with that and, and their mates get big massive contracts and make filthy offshore profits that uh you know can are never going to help the economy whereas if you give that money to somebody who's on a low wage and they spend it then the economic multiplier effect as they come up call it is going to you know cause that money to ricochet throughout the uh the economy and uh, and boost productivity boost uh you know kind of gross domestic product and all the other stuff uh and and do much more good as well as getting more bang for your buck out of the service itself that you're paying for because all of the money is essentially going on that service and on the people who provide it and not off to the Cayman Islands or something. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, there's only so many yachts anyone can buy, isn't there? <laughs> um, um, yeah. Also, I just, with regards to going back to British Gas, I mean, if, if so many of the, their engineers are leaving, I mean, surely that's going to have a massive impact on service. So, I mean, their problems presumably aren't going to get better as a result of this. I mean, what it is is a short-term kind of gain for perhaps the shareholders and the bosses, but not for uh, the company. And again, um, as Bonnie was saying, um, it's important to remember that, that when you're running a company primarily for your shareholders, um, you're actually not necessarily running it in the interests of the company itself either in the service. So, um, yeah, and, and this, this just stuff just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. So... Um, yeah, it's the question is what to do about it, I guess, and how to stop it and how to reverse it. I mean, yeah, one of the things we see is the shareholders and so on making an awful lot of money. And the directors at the top, the CEOs and what have you, uh, move from organisation to organisation. And what you see is a, sort of a, a systematic asset stripping of these public services. So there's very little left when it is time to renationalize the service and we see we saw it on the railway when mm. um virgin east coast trains went bankrupt they handed their keys back to the government the government built back up the service it started turning a profit and lo and behold the conservative government decided to reprivatize it i mean it's it's an endless cycle they're waiting for for you and i to pick up the pick up the pennies when when their privatization fails mm. and um and then they, they they wander off into the sunset with our money yeah it's, it's also <laughs> as soon as it starts yeah. turning a profit we will well you know well that's too good for the people we, we don't want the people to have that profit we'll, we'll give it over to the to our you know our, our 
not necessarily friends, but associates in the private sector, and, and they'll know how to run it properly. I mean, this is uh, such a big topic, and you, you also have the issue of um, sort of the revolving door between, since we had the, um, the privatisation of utilities, you've got the revolving door between um, Westminster and, and the boards of these companies, and that ever since that happened in, with Thatcherism, so you've got all sorts of problems with politics, vested interests, and all that kind of thing, which is it's just a huge, a huge subject. Um, Yes. And, you know, as we've seen with the various scandals going on at the moment, most of this seems to be around uh, enriching Tory backers. Um, and, you know, and I mean, how they even manage to still keep a straight face when they're making the argument is is, is surprising because you end up with the, uh, you know, when the rail franchises go bust and they get run by the government again, you know, the, then... Mm. then they work better <laughs> and they actually end up making you know they actually end up profitable again and, and all they do then is as you said just flog it off again because think well it's making a profit now we'll give it to some, you know, somebody that we owe for their donations or whatever um and you know i think if it wasn't for the sick media kind of setup that we have in this country where the so-called mainstream media are all too willing to you know parrot or support the uh the government's largely baseless claims, you know, where they just they'll, they say something and the BBC just repeat it as if it's a fact. And, you know, the others are very similar. It's, uh, you know, it's just an appalling state of affairs where the whole country's getting the wool pulled over its eyes. But if you get your news from the six o'clock uh, BBC News or Sky or whatever, then, you know, you, you're going to know very little of this stuff going on. And probably not, you know, you'd probably hardly be aware that, um, you know, Matt Hancock, for example, was found to have acted unlawfully in the way he was awarding his dodgy uh, pandemic contracts out to to Tory donors and so on. And mm. uh, you know, I'm still I'm still I still remember and you know make a, a very bitter uh, smile over the fact that you know somebody said if you put five thousand into a savings account now you'll you know you, you'd have five thousand and a few pennies probably with the interest rate. <laughs> yeah. If you put five thousand into Matt Hancock's uh, you know kind of Conservative Party costs then uh, you'd end up with a couple hundred million or whatever it was on a, on a PPE contract. Mm. And uh, and that's the state of it. So, you know, in this in a political landscape like this, you would hope that the opposition party would be not hesitating to make hay with, mm. uh, you know, with, with what the government is doing, um, holding them to account, making so much noise that it becomes impossible to ignore. Uh, sadly, with Keir Starmer, we've seen uh, an entirely different approach of, you know, basically applauding everything that Boris Johnson does. And, and if he criticises largely, it's been, you know, do it a bit faster or, you know, do what you're doing, but do it a bit differently. It's not, you know, there isn't really an opposition in that sense. Uh, and, you know, on this particular topic, if the Labour Party starts shouting too loud about, you know, British Gas um, laying off its workforce, then, you know, the right wingers will only be able to point straight back at the Labour Party. So... Uh, the other news, again, which the Squawk Box brought uh, this afternoon, is that a further 90 um, Labour Party staff have been told that they're out of a job from the end of May. Um, and, you know, they've received those uh, just today, as I understand it. So, you know, that's the third tranche, uh, as far as we can work out, of, of layoffs that Labour has made. Um, they have uh, they, they laid off quite a lot of uh, staff back in June. Uh, or, you know, furloughed staff. And as soon as it looked like it was going to cost them a penny to keep them on furlough, they, uh, you know, they bailed out of that and wanted to get rid of them. Um, and Unite and other unions, you know, an action led again by uh, Unite's Howard Beckett, um, managed to get a reprieve for those staff. And Phil, I think you're one of those. You'll be able to. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, um, but, but in September, yeah. um, you know, they did it again. And then in January, uh, February, they laid off all of their community uh, engagement workforce, which is wonderful because it you know, showed them giving up on the community uh, and, and replacing that with a few flags in the background by the looks of it. Yeah. Um, and now they're doing it again with another 90 staff. So give, give us your take on that, Phil, and a bit about your experience, please. Um, um, I, I, yeah, I, I struggle to, be, um, to, to understand it, really, because I, I find it shocking. I mean... 
when I when I was still working for the Labour Party, which was um, around this time last year, actually, I was um, <clears throat> looking into coronavirus and, and looking at the various kind of policy solutions to it. Um, and, you know, there's all, all sorts of things that I was talking about, such as, for instance, the need to uh, have a not not have a, an early return to schools. And, you know, the moment I was writing that up, I, I, I looked at the, the, the independent um, website online and um, I saw an image of Keir Starmer saying, you know, we need to get kids back into the classroom. And, you know, it, was, it's, it just seems his whole approach to this and, and particularly, and I think um, his approach to, well, not, not just him, but the kind of the Labour Party um, leadership's approach to it. It's the NEC's approach to it. Uh, always the majority of them seems to be completely out of touch with reality um, and the kind of the lives of ordinary people. Um, uh, to the to the point that they don't seem to um, grasp how this will play out, sort of um, in the public. When when you're saying one thing, for example, you're criticising the government for not doing enough, and then you, you're basically replicating that behaviour within your own organisation. Um, it's it's almost as if you you've got this kind of again, it's a little bit like the strangely, it's a bit like the privatised utilities because you've got a class of people at the top who don't seem to to, to understand or care about what the Labour Party is actually supposed to be for um, and therefore they don't understand why it's bad to lay off staff in the middle of a pandemic and, and you know not give them the, the, the most furlough possible um, and yeah and, and they, they also they don't understand the needs of the organisation either um, it, it's very it's very kind of top down and certainly the impression I got while I was um, sort of short period while I was under working under Keir's leadership um, was was a big shift from from Jeremy's point of view um, and I, I do I've, when, I, when I worked in Lotto I got to know Jeremy quite well because um, he's, he's very very he's, he's really quite different to say Keir Starmer because um, Jeremy actually I was you know, low ranking member of staff so not particularly important but um, Jeremy um, would actually come and talk to me and you know he, he would offer people coffees and stuff and you know really kind of friendly and and Keir was really aloof whenever he came in he was a, he was Brexit secretary at the time so he was he was in quite a lot but he didn't really speak to the staff at all mm. and and I think um there's just a basic kind of disconnect um and this is just my take on it between but a basic disconnect between his his kind of point of view and Everybody, you know, kind of the normal people um, and that is how I suppose the, the kind of explains why Labour Party um, policy is is just sort of it's nowhere at the moment and it isn't addressing um, the needs of the country and the needs of ordinary people within it um, and I think the reality is if you look if you if you look at what the Labour Party is doing and how it's treating its staff it, it's it's not a million miles away from from the way British Gas is treating its staff, mm. um, in the sense that it, it's due to the mismanagement from the top, which is what you've got with Keir Starmer, um, he's made a number of, of really, really stupid decisions, in my view. Um, you know, not just political decisions, but just, just bad decisions when it comes to management. Um, so, you know, kicking Jeremy Corbyn out of the party is, is, is mm. obviously one of them, alienating the membership. Um, preventing democracy and briefing against the left when most Labour members probably, are, you know, would consider themselves to be left wing. Um, he's been too close to the Tories. And, and what that does as well is it means that people aren't going to want to donate. Because if, you, if you're a member of the Labour Party, if you're a supporter of the Labour Party, one of the things that you, you are is you're against the Tories and their kind of philosophy. Well, if you've got the leader of the party standing up there saying, I support the Tories, um, or I support the government, then um, then they're going to lose interest, and they're not going to they're not going to want to spend their money through small donations and things. And so, the I guess what I'm saying is that the the, the financial circumstances the Labour Party is in, um, not too different from British Gas, is are a kind of a direct result of leadership decisions. It's not the fault of the staff that they're in this mess, and actually, it's the staff um, who they'll be having to rely on to get them out of it come election time and that's why again it's a competence issue because you've got um you, we're coming up to the elections in may local elections huge set of local elections and um <coughs> the, the leadership's just decided that now is the time to lay off 90 staff and 90 is a lot for the labor party it really is a lot of staff um so that they're actually shooting themselves in the foot just as they go into crucial elections 
Um, to me, I, I say I can only explain it through incompetence and, um, and and kind of elitism, basically. I just don't think they understand what they're doing. Yes, well, I mean, you know, it may well be that uh, Keir Starmer and David Evans will will try and blame it on the finances. I mean, let's not forget, under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership uh, and before <laughs> Keir Starmer took over, the, the party was in the healthiest financial condition it had been in in decades. Um, you know, I remember myself being at the conference where the party treasurer stood up and uh, you know, <coughs> said, you know, excitedly how great the finances were, that decades worth of debt had been wiped out that uh you know the the party uh, income was much higher than its outgoings and and so on and so on and that was driven by the fact that the party was offering a, you know actually offered a vision and had mm. somebody that that you know that clearly had the integrity to push that vision through if if given the opportunity um and you know the, the financial results of that were obvious you know mm. and people believed in it and were prepared to put their money where their mouth was put their time where their mouth was and uh, you know, so we've gone from being in the black to being in a situation where allegedly the party is on its on a, on a path to bank bankruptcy, where some of its largest union donors have uh, you know declined to donate, and some of them are even debating whether or not they're going to remain affiliated at the moment. We talked to uh, the Baker's Union's uh, boss uh, a month or two ago, and uh, he was telling us about the you know the initial results on their consultation with members was heavily. Uh, against remaining affiliated because men couldn't see what the point was in in supporting the party, and you know this is the labour movement. We've got a labour movement which is supposed to be uh, fighting for working people, and you know the, the the whole origin of the party was in defending working people. And if it's if it's not doing that, then you wonder what the uh, you know what the point of it is. And I mean, I say that as somebody who's still clinging on by his fingernails to his membership. Yeah, I've, I've actually um, left. Um, myself, because yeah, partially it was over the um, the pandemic stuff. But the, the the key point is, I mean, for me, I would go further than you there, Stephen. I would say that actually, it's not just that it's not looking, it's not kind of fighting for the interests of workers. It is, it is behaving like um, a, a nasty corporation, um, you mm -hmm. know, it, it, in terms of where it treats its own staff. Um, and like you say, when, when Keir Starmer criticises the government, he criticises them from the right often enough. And he criticises them um, almost as if he's saying, look, you're, you're actually, you're not being nasty enough. You, you need to be worse. <laughs> and, 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 and he seems to think that that, I mean, I, I guess the logic is to win over corporate backers. And, um, and that way the Labour Party finances. <laughs> but, you know, if you're, a, if you're a donor and you've got loads of money, I mean, right now, you'd be looking at the Labour Party and the Conservatives and you'd be thinking, well, where am I, where's, what's my best investment? Well, I'll go with the Tories because they're going to win the next election because Keir Starmer doesn't know what he's doing. Yes, and I mean, those, uh, you know, rich donations. When we saw the uh, leader of Scottish Labour uh, removed uh, effectively by Starmer in order to mm. uh, appease some rich donors who said they would put some money in, but, you know, there don't seem to have been any sign of that, certainly in, in terms of, laying off staff you know if you, you it's a major crisis and i mean we don't know exactly how many staff the labor party employs but you were saying phil that uh you know 90 is a sizable chunk of that workforce it's not yeah. just a uh, nibbling around the edges or whatever um yeah. go on mate yeah yeah i was just going to say i think it's a case you know when, when you're laying off that level of staff for example i worked in lotto and i think it fluctuated a bit but i think there's a sort of by and large around 30 people in that um office at a time and it's not like we were all just sitting around twiddling our thumbs it was it was busy it was there was a lot of work to be done um and you know and there's, there's, I, i'm not sure about the south side numbers because i didn't, didn't go there very much but um you know w when you're talking about 90 members of staff in an organization like the labor party you really are the, the question is is which bits of the operation are you going to cut back so mm -hmm. again this is this is this is um and i, I would say this I'm very critical of Keir Starmer's leadership, obviously. You know, you know, I, I don't, I'm, I, I don't think I'm going too far to say that this kind of the crisis of his leadership this, this year um, is existential for the party across a whole range of levels. Um, and one of one of the things is financial, um, and, and we're now seeing that. I mean, we're going, they're going into an election, um, and they're cutting staff as they do that. And um, we've also, which the story that you broke again, Steve, which is the Liam Byrne one. Um, 
about you know his, his staff going unpaid as well you know there are ramifications for this i mean i don't know what's going on there you know behind the scenes but this is um it's uh it, it's it looks like it's falling apart it really does look like a collapse um i mean i don't know what your your understanding of it is or your your opinion of it is well, I'll let Bonnie have a word first before I draw it on to Bob. Uh. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, there's so much to cover, isn't there? I mean, in the Starmer has been elected now for just over a year, and in that year, we've had him say no ifs, no buts about return to schools. We've seen between him and David Evans, the um, the standing, the acting general secretary. We've seen a clampdown of our democracy. We've seen members suspended we've seen jeremy corbyn being treated so appallingly and he was the leader of our party that brought a record number of members to us after all and as steve said did uh, see our finances go into the black for the first time in a considerable period we've got um the sacking dismissal of large numbers of staff three weeks outside of an election period in the middle of Perda, which is absolutely shocking. We've got the shenanigans that have gone on in Liverpool, and we've got now apparently an issue with the finances of the party. Now, that is quite a catalogue of catastrophe. And it seems to me either this is happening or, uh, as a result of incompetence on the part of Starmer and Evans, or arrogance on the part of Starmer or Evans, but I'm beginning to wonder if it's actually a deliberate sabotage because I can't see that any of this, its the, the mistakes have been so catastrophic. I really can't see that these things all happening together at the same time can be anything other than part of some deliberate plot, really. I mean, we, we're we hearing today as well, um, Keir Starmer is apparently getting the troops ready for a general election in two years' time. If it comes in two years' time, under the current leadership, we ain't winning. <laughs> <laughs> well, based based on today's performance before the local elections, getting ready for the uh, for a general election probably means sacking half the staff. You know, yeah. um, <laughs> get rid yeah, of the it, members it, as well. While we're at it, why not? I, I think, yeah. Go on, Phil. Yeah. Go on. Yeah, I think. Um, I mean, my my position for some time, my view for some time has been, um, again, with, with 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 like British British Gas. It's not the fault of the workers. You know. The, the, it's the leadership that needs to take responsibility for the company's failings. That's the way it should work. Um, and if the Labour Party is going to you know, behave like a corporate organisation, then um, the leadership needs to take its, it needs to go. It needs to resign because it's been catastrophic. Um, yeah. But I don't, I mean, and again, maybe this is, um, as Bonnie was saying, like it's been so catastrophic. Um, but I, I'm personally, I'm worried that, what comes after might be just as bad because it's a, it's not just Starmer. And I think we, I mean, I do as well. I get a bit sidetracked having a go at Starmer, but the, it's not just him. It's within the late, the kind of the right of the Labour Party. There is, there aren't any new ideas. Um, the kind of strategy that Starmer's putting forward is, is actually, I mean, it can't, really, I think it comes from um, John Crudus. It's the blue Labour sort of thing. Um, and and so and if you look at other people, other potential um, leaders from the right, they've all got the same platform. Um, and and to me, that that rests on a, a condescending uh, view of the working class, which is you know to, to win over the working class is all you need to do is drape yourself in the flag. And I really don't think that there are you know I, I think that there's a lot of Labour MPs that really just do not understand people. Um, which is, explains the Brexit thing as well. But I really just, I think, you know, Liz Kendall, again, today, as you mentioned, it was um, the comments about um, people who stack shelves. Um, well, and let's, let's have a look at that before we discuss it. I've got it, uh, I've got it here. Hopefully this will work. Repeated promises. The truth is, you'd be better off stacking shelves at Morrison's than caring for elderly, uh, older or disabled people, and that is simply not good enough for our country. Can the Minister confirm that the government's COVID infection control fund had to be used to improve pay, so staff didn't have to work for more than one care home and could actually afford to self-isolate? And if that's the case, will she commit to permanently enshrining these improvements across the sector to keep all care users and all care workers safe. Yeah, Minister. So, yeah, I mean, I've, I've had messages from irate 
Morrison's and, and mm. recent former Morrison's workers, because some of those have been let go as well, I gather. Um, appalled that you know that that the disrespect inherent in this idea of being treated that you know and it reminds me of, i used to work for a, a now defunct flooring company uh 30 years ago and um that that business used to do used to do tours for local school kids around their production area and uh one of the managers there that stopped when one of the managers heard the uh the teacher who was talking to the kids you know, if you, if you don't work hard in school, you'll end up in a place like this. <laughs> Which was, you know, and then these guys were making decent product and, you know, it was, again, it was, it was management, bad management that ran the business into the ground. It wasn't wasn't the workforce. And uh, those guys were, you know, were doing a decent day's work and getting at the time a decent day's pay. And, uh, you know, and, and being treated with contempt. And it's that, it's that similar thing, you know, if you, if you, if you you know, watch out or you'll get treated like supermarket workers. And these guys have been on the front line, you know, of the virus battle. They've been on the you know, front line of keeping everybody fed and with the basic, you know, the basics like bog roll after the first couple of weeks of the pandemic and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and then you've got a Labour um, front bencher getting up and talking about them with, with this kind of voice dripping with contempt. Temp. Go on, Phil, you were going to say something about this before I put the... Uh, yeah, I mean, again, I, I used to work stuck in shelves. Um, and again, this is a... I, there's no way, um, without Jeremy Corbyn, there's absolutely no way that I would ever have got to work in the office of the Leader of the Opposition um, because I have a normal background. So, you know, I, I used to work... I worked for Morrison's, I worked for Sainsbury's, I then, you know, I worked for public libraries. Um, I then worked in administration uh, and then, you know, as, as a random kind of, I had a bad day at work and I thought, yeah, you know, I'll look at the Labour Party website and see what's going. And um, there was this, this advert for the uh, kind of administrator in, in, in Lotto. And I fired it off because that was, it was, that day was the deadline. I thought, well, no, I'm never going to hear anything from this because there's thousands of people applying for it. And I, and I got it. Um, but that's because, and again, I think it speaks to a different kind of understanding um, that the snobbery, with Jeremy and, and the people around him, the snobbery wasn't there. Um, whereas you, you get the impression there's kind of a, a, an elitism from emanating from some people on the Labour front bench at the moment, um, which is it's, it's almost like they've kind of internalised this kind of imperial divide and rule mentality, which is we, we can't, you know, we can't win over um, this group of people without Pitting, pitting them against this group of people. So it can't be, um, you know, standing in solidarity with, with nurses and care workers and supermarket workers. It has to be one or the other, um, which is absolutely mad because from an electoral point of view, an electoral strategy point of view, the Labour Party needs all of them. Um, mm. You know, despite it being completely morally bankrupt and wrong, it's, it's, it's just, it's just com mad. It's, you know, electorally, strategically, it's completely mad. I mean, yeah. What do you think, Bobby? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was going to say, if you're going to start making comparisons, let's talk about uh, the right for care workers to be able to earn enough money to put food on their table mm. and raise their family. Let's yeah. not try and say, oh, well, these, you know, these people are at the bottom of the food chain and, you know, you'd be better off being at that, that end of the food chain than somewhere, somewhere higher up or what have you. It's absolutely ridiculous. All we need to be saying is these people are doing hard, emotionally draining, very difficult work that's incredibly responsible and they need to be paid accordingly. That's that's all she needed to say. I, you know, like you, Phil, I've spent my my Saturdays and afternoons and evenings and what have you working in supermarkets, too many to mention. Some of them don't even <laughs> exist anymore. But, you know, it's a good job you earn money. You, you know, you don't earn enough money. You don't earn an awful lot of money, but it's still yeah. worthwhile work that gives you something in your pocket. And I've, I've got to say, I've worked with some absolutely brilliant people, um, you know, in, in, in those jobs. You know, really, really good, decent, smart, intelligent, switched on people. Um, and it is it's really, it's, it's quite disgusting, actually, to have any MP from any party, but, you know, particularly one that's supposed to represent the working class, um, and again, it's it's almost as if you know ordinary people. Your opinion doesn't matter because we assume that you're all a bit ignorant and backward because you're stacking shelves in a supermarket, and therefore you know, or because you live on a council estate. And I, I've seen that from uh, politicians across party, and it just seems to me um, that the Labour Party establishment has become part of the broader establishment, and that's their 
you know that that's what they identify with and that's what they represent um jeremy definitely not you know jeremy is very different um but you, you you look at the way they treated him and it gives you a sense as to where the labor party is now hmm. i'm delighted to welcome demo on demo you got your son dropped off all right then <laughs> <laughs> Yes, he's got to work at last. You know, families. You know, well, last minute spanner in the works, eh? Yes, well, my kids are very good at that, quite frankly, aren't they? Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to come in on uh, on Liz Kendall and her commentary uh, this week uh, about uh, their somewhat derisory, derogatory uh, views of uh, supermarket workers. Uh, absolutely disgusting. Absolutely uh, reprehensible. They are. They have been key workers essentially throughout this pandemic. They have been keeping this country running. They've been ensuring that shelves are stocked. They've been ensuring that people are being able to get the goods they need while they're, uh, you know, they're, they're one you know, time they can leave home essentially to go and get groceries during this pandemic. Uh, if not, then they've been getting stuff ready to go with click and collect, for example, or people have been volunteering to deliver those goods to their door. Uh, but it wouldn't happen without these workers throughout the, uh, the supermarket chain doing what needed to be done. And for any MP, let alone a Labour one, I mean, for a Labour one to do this is particularly hurtful. It's a tick, particularly disgusting because we're supposed to be the party that represents these people, for heaven's sake. And it just reminds us, it sends a message, essentially, that this Labour party that we've got now doesn't seem to want to represent workers anymore. It, doesn't seem, it seems to be so out of touch with what it means to be working class or being a worker in general that uh, they, they think they, could, they they make comments like this and don't realise the hurt they're causing by doing it. Uh, and Liz Kendall should be thoroughly ashamed of herself. It yeah, actually so it reminds me a little bit of Tory... Well. It Sorry, reminds Steve. a little bit of Tory candidates being, um, you know, having no clue what the price of a pint of milk or a loaf of bread is or whatever. You know, it's that that out of touch and it's... You expect it from the Tories, but it's inexcusable from a, a Labour MP. Go on, Bonnie. Sorry. I Sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say... <coughs> Excuse me. It puts me in mind of the comments Laura Smith got when she lost her seat in the last elections. And my goodness, don't we miss her in Parliament right now? Um, she got a lot of sort of bizarre tweets in response to her putting out on social media that she'd gone to sign on. I mean, what else was she supposed to do? She just lost her job. Of course, she's going to go and sign on. And do you know what? If a shop job came along that she could fill, I'm sure she would have done it because it's about it's what a working class person does to pay the bills. Yeah. And, and that is what people like Liz Kendall seem to have forgotten. At some point, you know, maybe she might need to go and sign on or find some alternative work to be an, M an MP. <laughs> and I wonder what kind of ride she'll get as a result when she goes to apply to the supermarket down the road to try and make mm -hmm. ends meet. Well, you suspect that the problem, you know, a large part of the Labour Party's problem in Parliament is that there aren't enough people who, if they lost their job as an MP, would end up working in a supermarket. Uh, you know, we need more people who've come from the hard side of life on the Labour benches and the Labour front benches and ideally in the leadership, uh, yeah. you know, and, and not just people who've come through the, uh, you know, politics, philosophy and whatever it is at, uh, you know, at Cambridge or somewhere and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and would fall back on a job in the city or something if they if they lost their job <coughs> in the MP. Um, you know, I, I think part of this is the whole way that Parliament's set up really is to, you know, it mitigates against people who communicate like normal people. <laughs> you know, the, the my honourable friend this and untalented yeah. language that, etc. You know, and and we want you know the, the reason Dennis Skinner became such a cult hero is he talks like you know he's got a very good turn of phrase, but he, he talks like the rest of us. And I would much rather have a parliamentary session where they were all calling each other dopey twats than <laughs> you know than my honourable friend on the other side of the house. Yeah. When you know, you, if you're not, you ought to be diametrically opposed to each other's kind of point of view, mm -hmm. because you know the Labour Party. And I was having this conversation with somebody else earlier on, actually, uh, completely offline, but they brought it up. Uh, you know, just this the, the Labour MPs who rub it in, you know, in people's faces on social media when they go out for a, you know, a meal or a drink or whatever with the Tory MP, mm -hmm. and you know, the, this person's local councillors, you know, the the leader of the council's a Tory, the deputy leader's a Labour uh, councillor, and yet they're best of pals and go to all each other's events. And, you know, it's not, when you've got people, if you've got people, in, you know, in, in, a, in authority who are, you know, mildly varying on their opinion on something, well, that's probably the situation that we have got. But, you know, really, when you've got, you know, the, the Tory party actively 
pushing things that result in large numbers of deaths mm. and misery for millions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know that you shouldn't be pally with those people. You should be going for their throat, metaphorically speaking, and doing everything you possibly can to distance yourself from them and get them out of power. And uh, this whole kind of collegiate attitude among MPs, to my mind, is a disservice to people uh, who are horribly suffering for the past decade and more uh, under the Conservatives. Another Laura who lost her seat, Laura Pidcock, got absolutely um, hauled over the coals for saying she wouldn't want to go for a drink with the Tory. Well, mm. I'm afraid I agree with her. We spend our lives fighting against what these people stand for politically and why would you want you know why would you want these people as your friends you can have nothing we should have nothing in common with them no it's this business of parliamentary language i always think i'd struggle with it to look across the opposite benches and look at all these conservative things lined up and to refer to any of them as honorable <laughs> um yes. but steve you're absolutely right about what you're saying with um, you know, people who are from the, the hard side of life i would i would uh, perhaps call it the real side of life myself because it's real life these people are experiencing the everyday lives that we all go through and millions of people like us up and down the country and the vast majority of parliamentarians don't they haven't come from that background they don't belong to that background anymore and that goes for all sides of the house it's mm. the working class parties the parties that purport to represent working class people have lost their way. They don't share much in common with working class people. And I think this is why Labour as a whole is seen largely as a middle class party these days. And its membership certainly does reflect that, sadly. Uh, and working class mm. people are filled with apathy and uh, disillusionment. And they look at this pantomime that goes on between Boris Johnson and Keir Starmer and they think, well, how am I supposed to, you know, one of these two people under our electoral system, they're going to run the country. And I can't stand either of them. So why should I vote mm. for either of them? Mm. Because they both basically look and sound the same. Yeah. One has a better haircut. Practically, you probably <laughs> you probably get more MPs on the uh, on the labour benches if there was a an unpleasant spike in the price of quinoa or something. Than, uh, <laughs> than you would do over you know over one hundred and fifty thousand deaths. Make sure they vote against the, the, the quinoa. Um, yeah, that's the that's the state yeah. of things. I mean, you know, while we're on the topic of inappropriate language in in the Commons. You know, genuinely inappropriate, rather than what they would call it, unparliamentary, and uh, you know, inappropriate comparisons as well. I mean, we saw Keir Starmer uh, attempting to put Boris Johnson on the spot of a, of a corruption, and uh, and this was how it went. Um, oh, wrong one. Excuse me. There we go. His, uh, that's the point of his review. Uh, it's an independent review. We're coming to me by, by June. I'll, we're glad it will, it will be played in the, uh, in the library of the, of the House of Commons. I talk about lobbying, Mr. Speaker. He's being advised uh, by Lord Mandelson of Global Council Limited. Uh, perhaps in the interests of full transparency, so we can know uh, where he's coming from, Lord Mandelson could be encouraged uh, to disclose his other clients, Mr. Speaker. Here, Starmer. Mr Speaker, I haven't heard a defence that ridiculous since my last days in the Crown Court. It's, it's called the shoplifter's defence. Everyone else is nicking stuff, so why can't I? Mr Speaker, it never worked. I remind the Prime Minister, I not only prosecuted shoplifters, I prosecuted MPs over the MPs' expenses scandal. Uh, right, so... If you want to compare David Cameron to somebody in Keir Starmer's mind, he's, he's on a par with the shoplifter. And, you know, the, my understanding is, and again, I've had this comment sent to me by a few people, that, you know, a lot of shoplifters, by no means all, but a lot of people who resort to shoplifting are mentally ill, uh, in desperate poverty, uh, you know, or making some other kind of cry for help. Um, you know, that it's driven him into doing that. If you want to compare David uh, Cameron's alleged corruption, uh, you know, and the general Tory uh, situation with their cronyism and corruption uh, to anything. It's probably not somebody who may be, you know, nicking baby milk because they can't afford to, uh, you know, they can't afford to eat properly to feed, mm. feed their kids, you know, feed their new baby or whatever. Um, it's just, you know, is, is it just a general contempt? Is it just being out of touch? Is it a mix of all of them? I, I'm really not sure, but it just horrifies me. I think Keir Starmer's track record as a uh, as a prosecutor has come under scrutiny a number of times, and some of the cases he's been involved on, on and have been uh, slightly um, disturbing. 
and uh, have not gone down well with an awful lot of people for, for one reason or another, depending on that case. Um, to use this as some sort of defence, I think in Keir Starmer's case, it just shows complete disregard for, for, for working class people again and complete disregard for where people are generally in this country with regards to poverty. Um, given that the only uh, member of his shadow cabinet he ever seems to let out onto uh, his camera and uh, apparently is the only person that tends to have his ear these days is Rachel Reeves and her mm -hmm. uh, her opinion on people on benefits is, is that that's a matter of public record and is remind, reminded, uh, she's reminded constantly of it years on from from when she said it, uh, she promised that Labour was going to be tougher on benefits claimants than the Tories were. And she will forever be have that uh, comment hung around her neck, and so she should. Uh, Chris Starmer, I think, is, is cut from the same cloth. He's of that same mould. He's of that same opinion. And he just doesn't see the error of what he's saying. We're talking about corruption at a government level. And it's mm. not the first time. This government is full of it. They keep, keeps getting referred to as cronyism. Um, it, it, it's not, it's corruption, pure and simple, and it, it's a breach of the law. But whenever they've got to uh, launch an inquiry, whenever they get found out and they go, oh, we've got to do an inquiry on this now, it always ends up being a, a case when you dig down into it and look at the people who were involved in carrying out the inquiries, that it's a case of people marking their own homework. Mm -hmm. um, now, bringing Peter Mandelson into uh, his, his, uh, his circle is, is, is a grotesque error, frankly. Um, mm -hmm. For, for Keir Starmer, it, it, it really is, um, yeah, exactly like that comment says on the screen. I mean, to, to be in a position where Boris Johnson can wriggle out of, of his his kind of major, major kind of corruption scandal uh, engulfing his government, um, because, because Peter Mandelson's there standing behind Starmer, tells you all you need to know about this guy's judgment. Um, and also, I mean, Peter Mandelson is not popular in the country at large. This is not some. It's, it's not an association that is going to bring people back to the Labour Party, and that's why Boris Johnson pointed it out, obviously. Um, and I think I just wanted to um, just kind of because Bonnie made a point earlier, if questioning um, whether it was um, wh whether it was it was incompetent, or so whether it really are really are trying to destroy the Labour Party. Um, my view is is that I really think it's it's incompetence. I, I think they want to be in government. In fact, some of the conversations that I overheard uh, in the brief period I was working for Starmer suggested that they assumed they would be in government very, very soon. Um, these are people who are uh, they're perhaps not very bright, but they are really, really bad at politics. Um, they're really, really bad at what they're supposed to be doing. Um, they, they do not know what they're doing at all. Um, which is why, I mean, from a policy point of view, it's a mess as well. I mean, everything is just a mess. They don't know what they're doing. I think it's um, it's out of control, basically. And, yes. and the, the the problem that the sort of the Labour Party has is that obviously the, the strongest force in the party is, is the right, um, and they and the rest of the Labour right. I mean, this is the agenda that they've been pushing for so long. You know, while Jeremy's leader, this is what they wanted. Um, so yeah, they can get rid of Keir Starmer, but they, there's no other for the Labour right, there's no other um, no other kind of way forward. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm just going to go and, and turn a light on because I realise I'm getting quite dark. <laughs> is that well, right? I mean, while you're, while you're doing that, uh, Phil, there's, there is, there are some MPs who are showing how it should be done. I mean, one of them, uh, Mary Foy made an intervention on, uh, on Twitter this afternoon uh, where she showed how, you know, what kind of uh, opposition you should put up when uh, you're talking about David Cameron, etc. Greensville is the latest in a seemingly unending conveyor belt of cronies and scandals under this government. In the last 16 months, we've had the West Ferry development and the Towns Fund scandal. Government contracts have been handed to the Health Secretary's pub landlord and to firms linked with Dominic Cummins and to the Conservative Party, while billions have been wasted on a test and trace system run by the partner of a second Conservative MP. I could go on. At the start of this pandemic, the government promised to do everything it could. I assumed that this meant everything ministers could do to defeat the virus, not everything they could do to make their rich mates even richer. <laughs> In the Labour Party, we listen to the voices of the workers and the disenfranchised. The Conservatives listen to the greed of their chums and the donors. 
For many of them, this pandemic was simply an opportunity. And it makes me sick that the Chancellor pushed officials to help a wealthy ex-Prime Minister while ignoring the excluded. And when I raised the struggles of a business in Durham, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury told me that not every single job will be protected. Did the Chancellor tell David Cameron that not every stock would be protected? We cannot have another classic whitewash where the government marks their own homework. It's time for a proper inquiry, not just at the Green Cell, but into the culture of corporate lobbying that plagues politics. It's a sad fact that the public don't trust politicians, but when they say this scandal or any of the others overseen by this government, then who can blame them? We need to demonstrate a commitment to ending this lobbying culture that protects the interests of a few at the expense of many. And that starts with a proper inquiry. I expect my protest will fall upon the deaf ears of a government who cannot hear me or the pleas of my constituents over the words of corporate lobbyists. But David Cameron's actions have once again shown that Tory ministers cannot be trusted. So in the absence of the beast of Bolsover, I will still refer to our former Prime Minister as Dodgy Dave. How it's done. Absolutely. Dodgy Dave, on the head there. Dodgy Dave is absolutely right. And, and Mary made a, a, an excellent point where this, this fundamentally comes down to trust in politics. It damages trust in politicians. And when it's over and over again, more and more corruption, more and more scandals, she listed several there, uh, the Conservatives should absolutely be on the ropes. The trouble is Labour, we come back to trust again. Where's the Ford report? There's an inquiry that was done by our party. We haven't seen the results of that yet. And that brings into and this gives the conservatives an out you know it, it, it's that uh that, that same you know um well attempted a a, a reasoning that keir starmer attempted to make if we can get away with it uh if those people can get away with it then why can't we and the conservatives can point to keir starmer's board report and say just just that and actually on another point we can come back to keir starmer's 10 pledges which have all been broken yeah. to this point now and again, that damages trust. And you've got a, a guy here who, as, as Phil has said, expected to be the next prime minister. But quite frankly, he's as untrustworthy as the one we've got now. I don't trust him. And when trust is broken, that's not something that can be fixed. And I, I really don't think that, that Labour have any ground to, uh, to believe that they're going to reach power the way things are currently at this moment in time. Uh, certainly not with this leader that we've got now. They need to they need to restore trust yeah. in the in the political system. They need to restore people's trust in Labour. And when Labour members don't even trust Keir Starmer, then they've got a big problem there. Yeah. Can I also uh, something popped up on the screen which is quite interesting. They're saying that they can't believe that I uh, I think Keir Starmer is not doing this on on purpose. Um, my view is that is that if Keir Starmer was doing this on purpose, when it, when it comes to um, kind of destroying the Labour Party, he's doing a really, really good job of it. I do not credit him with that am amount of competence. You know, so, so what I'm saying is worse. Uh, I'm saying that he wants to win, but he is so awful at what he's doing that he is destroying um, not just the Labour Party, but also his chances of becoming Prime Minister. In fact, I'd go further. I'd say he has destroyed his chances of becoming Prime Minister. He is not going to win an election. And I did polling research for him as well. <laughs> so I, I did say this to him. I did say you've got to actually oppose the government, mate. <laughs> so, yeah. I think we're here. I think I think Keir would do very well to steer clear of referencing his previous um, job as director of public prosecutions. It wasn't a role that was filled with glory. At the end of the day, he was the DPP responsible for prosecuting kids pinching bottles of water during the, the London and elsewhere riots that happened in 2011. And there are a number of other things where he made appalling decisions in that position. Um, I... I really completely agree with everything Mary uh, Kelly Foy said. The thing that concerns me as well is um, the David Cameron corruption scandal has taken so many headlines when it is a relatively small, and I'm not saying there should be any form of corruption within government, 
but compared to the corruption of the tens of billions of pounds that have gone on the track and trace app that has never and will never deliver and all of those things we're looking at not only billions of pounds of our money being given to their mates in a corrupt way we're looking at over 150,000 people dying as a result of their incompetence too. So we're not just talking about money, we're talking about mm. mostly working class people's lives. And the Labour Party have failed to call that corruption out. And that is inexcusable as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and I sometimes wonder if there is maybe some reticence in calling out this corruption um, because I don't know if you're aware of it, but local to me, there's um, there's a journal called Inside inside Croydon which yeah. is a constituency just down the road now David Evans is a Croydon Labour Party member and in Croydon he established a company called the Campaign Company which was initially established to to lobby and um, do surveys and things on behalf of Blairite MPs and um, just recently um, Croydon Council has been declared bankrupt and there's a number of questions about why they've gone bankrupt but uh, Inside Croydon have suggested David Evans's company, which he no longer owns, he passed it over to his wife, um, might have some um, questions that need to be answered there. And the thing that makes it more concerning is the former Labour leader of the council in Croydon and another councillor have both had to quit their jobs because I believe the stench that's coming from that corruption there too. So, you know, maybe Keir is just looking out for his friend, uh, making out that corruption doesn't matter if what inside Croydon is alleging is accurate um we need to not just be looking at the massive corruption that's gone on at the hands of this government that has cost lives but also do a review of political corruption and financial mm. corruption that's gone on both sides of the house mm. can I just um also come in on that because again I've been campaigning against a um an estate regeneration in a neighbouring borough of Kingston upon Thames. Um, so I've actually been looking at, uh, at what's going on in Croydon because um, it seems to be that it's going to be the harbinger of things to come in Kingston. Um, but I think it's interesting because it goes back to our earlier discussion about um, British gas. And in terms of housing, you, you've got um, what is an asset that's effectively being stripped um, for profit. And the interesting thing about kind of David Evans's um, alleged role in that, or at least in setting up the company, is that here you have the General Secretary of the Labour Party, whose background appears to be in this very kind of corporatist sort of um, vested interest um, that, that we see with the Tory party. So the idea that, you know, electing Keir Starmer and his team into power is somehow going to change things in this country, I think is for the birds, really. It says a lot when the uh, the Conservatives can make a lot of the, a lot of uh, this this issue with David Cameron and it effect effectively use corruption as a dead cat to cover up more of their own corruption. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but again, Labour, as you said, as, as another excellent example that Bonnie's just given us. It's another example of, of the Labour Party being just as bad at it, being just as up to their necks with dodgy dealings as well. Uh, you, and uh, it, it thoroughly needs investigation and, and it's routing out because people do expect this of the Conservative Party. They say, oh, well, they always do this sort of thing. They mm. always expect better of Labour. But when Labour are just as bad, that damages Labour more. And hence we see Keir Starmer going in the polls. And yet, despite everything... Boris Johnson's still riding on high. Mm -hmm. it, it's utterly bizarre. It's so, so wrong. But there we are. It's also, yeah, I mean, we don't know, you know, we don't know what the, exactly how the process was uh, was decided. I mean, one of the one of the people who got a contract out of Labour Party to uh, do their um, online voting systems when, when they moved their meetings to, uh, to Zoom uh, told me that uh, basically said, uh, I had a chat with somebody uh we we suggested the contract and they agreed it and that was it so you know there didn't seem to have been any any competitive process but the issue is you know if you're going to try and th throw the the brick bats at boris johnson that he thoroughly deserves you've mm. got to make sure that you're whiter than white on those things you've got to be transparent you've got to make sure there's nothing he can throw back at you you know employing peter bleeding mandelson you know, to uh, you know, as, as as the person who's going to take Labour forward to the future, 
Um, you know, and and he's, you know, is is just nonsense when you, if you're going to start, you know, trying to attack a Tory government on its on its conduct and uh, and transparency. You know, millionaires, billionaires, yachts, and all this kind of stuff are just too easy to pick up and throw back. And uh, you know, it, it's it's just this lack of, you know, just I mean, he's, he's supposed to be, you know, the, the, when when he first got the Labour leadership, they called him the, uh, you know, they wanted to. Make this word forensic stick, you know, and it's stuck, but it's done so as a, as a bad job. Because I mean, it's not, you know, if you can have somebody who's managerial, at least be managerially competent. Mm. Uh, don't be, you know, don't do stupid stuff that, that anybody with alpha brain could tell you is stupid. And, you know, and we just haven't seen that. So I'm sort of between two stools, really, between the kind of, you know, deliberately wrecking it and, <laughs> and Phil's, Phil's, uh, no, he's not that competent to be able to wreck it on purpose. You know, it's just this. Well, you get if to only he'd listen to the membership, eh? Hey? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> if only he'd take a chance and listen to the membership, maybe we could. Well, that's uh, it, and I mean, I think that's the the overall thing. Sorry for talking over your body, but just the overall. We're going to have to wind up in a sec, but the overall kind of thing with this is just this kind of, you know, the well, purple thread. I won't say scarlet thread. That's a good color, but the purple thread that runs through all of this stuff with Keith Stam is just this this contempt and arrogance towards the rest of us, you know, or yeah. if it's Labour members and Labour's, you know, Labour members elected uh, local officers, if they speak out of turn, they get stomped mm -hmm. on. Uh, you know, we've seen, a, a, you know, Labour's longest serving councillor um, mm -hmm. recently get deselected explicitly because he criticised Keir Starmer. You know, we've seen MPs get punished because they say something that uh, Keir Starmer doesn't like. And, you know, we've seen Scottish Labour get treated as an outpost of Westminster by the party because, uh, you know, somebody told Keir that they didn't like the existing leader. We've seen, you know, problems between Westminster and Welsh Labour and, you know, just this general kind of high handed, contemptuous attitude towards the rest of us that can't possibly have a place in a, in a you know, supposedly working class party. And, and certainly not in one that's supposedly going to change the country for the better because people just won't believe it. You know, if, if it's do as I say, not as I do. And when I tell you jump, ask how high, etc., it's, it's just not going to get it done. He's got this attitude of I'm a uh, look at look at me. I'm the big I am. I've been the director of public prosecutions. I I'm knighted. I'm sir. Uh, look at me. I'm very wonderful. And uh, there's an arrogance that goes with that. And with that arrogance comes uh, a, a lack of ability to actually listen to people around you. Yeah. I mean, there's no doubt that Keir Starmer, for, to, to have the career he's had, yeah, sure, he's a clever guy. But clever guys aren't necessarily clever and good at everything. You can't be good at everything. And abundantly clear politics is not something he's good at. I mean, I'm reminded of somebody else who was very, very clever and was a complete disaster for this country, uh, Dr. Beeching uh, of the Railways fame. Very, very clever man, a physicist. Yeah. Um, put a physicist in charge of the railways, though. Mm, look what happened there, though. <laughs> appropriate, essentially. And he's got this really, really poor habit of just, you know, I, look at me. I, I'm Keir, I'm Sir Keir Starmer. I, mm. I, I know what I'm doing. I, I don't need to listen to you. I don't like what you're doing, but I'm, I'm not going to offer an alternative because that's forensic opposition. And this, it, it's just this. Spiral of not offering anything, but not liking what people are doing as it is, and it's just tearing the party mm. apart at the seams. Yeah. Now, a year on into his leadership, it's even his own wing of the party is getting torn apart a bit, and there's strain happening there. And mm. uh, this can't go on much longer. Something's got to give. And mm. I'm, I'm thinking the May elections are going to be it. I think something's got to give at that point. Okay. Yes, and uh, I mean we've seen. Yeah, you know, I mean let's be fair to Keir Starmer, you know. A lot of this is also, you know, well, we don't want to be unfair to him. Uh, we don't need to be unfair to him in order to, uh, <laughs> to him. but you know, a lot of this does apparently also originate from the people that he's gathered around him. Now, I mean, he's ultimately mm. to blame for that as well. But the, you know, the, the essentially, I mean, you know, so somebody last week in last weekend in the press was saying about, you know, it's it's a small kind of set from Camden or whatever that he's gathered around him, and they've all got the same outlook. If you're going to do that and not give yourself the input from people who actually know what what's what in other communities, you're never going to be uh, you're never going to be able to connect with them because 
nobody nobody knows what everybody's life's like you've got to yeah. you've got to get that from other people and he, he's basically surrounded himself with a set of people that all think the way he wants them to think or are determined to make him think the way they want they want him yeah. to think and yeah. either way that's that's bad news and sadly you know this is has come at a tragic time for the country because if you're in a country that has seen the vast numbers of deaths the vast numbers of people put out of work the huge economic impact of the pandemic etc and you're not opposing that effectively that is a betrayal of the people of the country and i think you know if and when people realize that that's happening and the you know the word leaks out past the media barrier of what's really going on then you know that will be i won't be forgiven mm. and uh, you know it's very interesting that the right wingers seem to think that as well because they're also now on maneuvers uh jockey and who's going to replace him so Bonnie, I can't crush you before. In apology for that, uh, I'm going to give you the last word on the show before we finish. And, uh, <laughs> no worries, we'll, Steve. We'll let you talk us out. <laughs> yeah, no, look, if we can't be three weeks outside of an election. I really want to be able to go out and campaign for a Labour Party that will represent the majority of people in this country. I want to be able to be phoning people up and asking them to vote for a Labour Party and have some un idea and understanding of what sort of policies we will get through as a result of securing Labour wins. I'm really beyond frustrated at the moment that it's being made so difficult to actually promotes people voting Labour. I want to. I want people to vote Labour. I want to see a Labour government. There needs to be a Labour government that's going to re represent the majority of people. I think we've covered loads of areas here where people need to be organised in trade unions and people need to be making their collective voices heard. The Labour Party should be where we get our voices heard. So I sincerely hope Keir Starmer, who sometimes watches our shows, has seen this programme, can take the ideas on the chin and maybe come and talk to us anytime he likes. You know, I'm sure we'd be glad to have him on Socialist Telly at some point. Let's have a question and answer session with uh, Keir Starmer and see if we can make this right. Because if their um, estimations are correct, we're two years outside of a general election. And at the moment, it's not one that we would win by any stretch of the imagination. Hmm. Well, we don't do no platform in here, so we would have him on if he was ever uh, foolhardy enough or whatever the, whatever the word would be to uh, to risk it. Um, I will just finish off uh, with a very quick plug. Don't forget, because it is very important for the word getting out effectively, hit the notification bell, particularly on YouTube and, and the subscribe button there. Um, do the same on, YouTube, on uh, Twitter, which has a similar facility on the Socialist Tele account, and uh, click through to, to select C first on the uh, Socialist Telly and Squawk, Book, Squawk Box page as well. A lot of this goes out as well uh, on Facebook to make sure that you get notified and, and it does the best to get around the um, algorithms of the social media that try to mitigate against the word getting out from the left. Um, and I will just put a quick plug in for what looks set to be a big Monday night uh, next week because uh, in short succession, we'll have the Squawk Talk program on where I'll be talking uh, to Miltos Yerolemu from Game of Thrones and an outstanding uh, left voice on social media. And it'll probably be a shorter version of the program because we're then going to take a very short break and come back with the Hartlepool hustings uh, between, uh, well, at the moment, between Thelma and an empty chair, uh, Thelma Walker and an empty chair, because uh, <laughs> the Labour candidate Paul Williams hasn't responded on whether he'll, uh, he'll participate. And sadly, in spite of putting the word out, uh, on Squawk Box to a large number of, uh, well, any centrist who cared to read it, inviting them to come on and defend him if they think he's the right candidate uh, and, and argue his case. Uh, nobody so far has responded on that either. Um, so at Good the point. moment, the empty chair is, is looking the most likely, but we will, uh, you know, allow the audience on that as well to put their questions uh, to the candidates or candidates, whoever turns up, and, uh, you know, to hear what they have to say about whether it's about specific policies for the area, policies in general for the country, et cetera, uh, to help people in Hartlepool decide who they want to back. And uh, other than that, thank you ever so much, everybody who's born with us for the program, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you to the panel who joined us at uh, short notice to present this. Solidarity with the British Gas Workers and with the Labour Party staff here who are being uh, unceremoniously kicked out of their jobs. And, uh, you know, yeah. as I mentioned at the top of the show, if you feel so inclined, do look at your contracts if you have any with British Gas and decide whether you want to uh, retain those or 
cancel them in the protest against the way that they've behaved towards their workers, as, as I personally have done today. Uh, thank Joining you, everybody. You. Keep watching Socialist Tally and uh, do make sure to share this uh, so people can watch and catch up and uh, our other programming coming up through the week. Thanks a lot. Take care.